Thanks for inviting me. It's an, a real honor to be here. I feel a little bit, um, a little bit nervous, but that's okay. Um, I'm an extension instructor, in, and I work with small-scale farmers in Multnomah, Washington, and Clackamas counties. So, it's a quite a different context from what I'm hearing about a lot here. A lot of the growers I work with are on less than 20 acres, but they grow 20 to 40 or 50 different crops. So we're trying to, you know, make nutrient management decisions in that in that kind of context. Um, Dan Sullivan is the soil scientist, and I'm, I'm the extension educator. So this is what. Um, I found myself looking at a lot in the spring is really good cover crops but um, and the growers that I was working with would sort of wave a fertilizer guide in front of me and say there's no way I need 200 pounds of nitrogen to grow sweet corn I couldn't afford it with organic fertilizers even if that's what you recommended and they would you know you know help me figure this out I don't you know my organic crops don't need this much nutrition and I don't think that the fertilizer guys were wrong. They were just developed in the context of a, you know, where, where you were supplying most of the nutrients w uh, from the fertilizers, whereas these growers were developing high levels of organic matter and developing and growing really high biomass cover crops, so they were getting these non-fertilizer nitrogen sources. And it's a lot more difficult to, to quantify those. Um, but what we've been trying to do is to come up with, with fairly simple ways to quantify non-fertilizer nitrogen so that we can kind of calibrate those fertilizer guides to different production systems. Um, so if you're comparing a cover crop to a, to a fertilizer, you don't know the application rate, the guaranteed analysis, uh, how much nitrogen is mineralized, um, and uh, what, we're, what we're moving towards uh, is trying to get growers to measure the biomass so they know what the application rate is, trying to get them to do a little bit of the lab analysis so they know what the total nitrogen content is. And then to understand um, mineralization, we've developed a very simple mineralization model that we've put online, but, all, but uh, that's, you know, a planning tool is not, not the uh, be all and end all. We're encouraging growers to monitor their soil nitrate levels during the season to make sure that the system, the soils are performing like they thought that they would. Um, this is a publication that Dan and I published in 2012 where we're focusing on plant available and release from cover crops and it's been getting downloaded quite a lot. We can now we can sort of count those downloads on, on the website. It was published in 2012 and it's been downloaded a little over 3,000 times so we know there's quite a bit of interest in the topic at least. Um, another project, Sarah Brown from uh, NRCS and Oregon Tilth has been working on um, organic equip programs. Um, she's the national organic specialist uh, with, with NRCS. And we've drafted a nutrient management plan 590 for organic systems. And this one, this is still in draft form, but it's a Western state implementation guide. And we're using some of the same rationale um, that, uh, that we included in that um, Pacific Northwest cover crop publication. Um, Dan had been working on nitrogen mineralization from uh, organic amendments for a while um, before I started working at OSU and um, found, you know, there's a pretty well established correlation between the total nitrogen in the amendment and the percentage of that nitrogen that's mineralized. Um, so as the total end got to about 6%, we found that the, um, he found that the percent, about 70 to 80 percent of that 6 percent would be mineralized during the course of the season. He didn't have a lot of data for, a lot of his data was from broiler litter, dairy solids, rabbit manure, yard trimmings, but he didn't have a lot of data from high nitrogen um, specialty fertilizers like um, you know, feather meal, blood meal, that sort of thing. So we did uh, a few more mineralizations with some of those products and came up with a um, mineralization model, a full season mineralization model, and then a a 28-day or quick-release nitrogen model that growers can use. Um, our, our goal since 2006, 2007 has been to extend that fertilizer mineralization information to cover crops. And um, he found a very pretty similar uh, correlation between the total nitrogen in the cover crop and the percentage of nitrogen that's mineralized. This is the sort of break-even point between mineralization and immobilization. On the left is a 28-day 
snapshot, and on the right is a 70-day snapshot. The line that we've got in there isn't a fit to our data. It's the Vigil and Kissel uh, work that was done in the late 80s, early 90s, looking at mineralization from lots of different uh, crop residues. So um, in the work that we were doing, this, the 70-day uh, mineralization actually fit V. Hill and Kissel slope pretty well. So we felt reasonably comfortable using that as a decision tool for growers. One of the questions that growers asked was, what about you know, the different species of cover crops? What about the different types of soils? So we tested um, you know, this sample of, of species with different ratios of these species in some of the soils, silt loams and sandy loams that are really common in our area. And we found um, the open circles there are the 70-day mineralization rates. So we found a you know, reasonably good fit between the V. Hill Kissel line and, and what we were seeing as far as mineralization. So in the, um, we wanted to develop this as an online tool, as a spreadsheet. So we included different mineralization models for stable compost, uh, for fertilizers, quick release fertilizers in the full season. Uh, fertilizers and then also cover crops. In general, um, our mineralization rates from the cover crops were a little bit higher than the than the models than the than the line shows, which you know we felt comfortable with. We didn't want to um, recommend excessive uh, you know credit nitrogen credits from cover crops, and we have been using um, just forage analysis or you know biomass sampling to to estimate cover crop biomass. Um, when I, you know, and that's a nice crimson clover stand that was, wasn't that hard to work the frame down within, but uh, in a rye vetch stand, I've been knocking it over, <laughs> uh, knocking it over and then laying the frame on top just to get an idea rather than working it through the canopy. It's a little bit, a little bit more practical. So um, handling the sample is pretty important. We just um, take, apart, uh, take out any soil, of course, and then just spend about three or four minutes ripping the plants apart so that we can get a decent subsample. And then we weigh the total, the total sample from the field and send in about a one pound subsample in a paper bag to the lab um, and ask for total percent nitrogen and percent dry matter. We've been doing the percent uh, dry matter our, on our own, but, but that takes a little bit more accurate scale. So we've been recommending the growers just send a fresh sample into the lab and get the lab to grind the whole sample and dry the whole sample and, and get, get the lab to measure that. And then we put the, um, the uh, information that you get from the lab goes into the calculator, which is on our small farms website. Um, this is a, a couple of screenshots of the, of the spreadsheet. Um, this is the cover crop analysis part. So you can enter, you enter your field names. So I've just put the cover crop species, common vetch, rye vetch. Um, the area that you sampled, the fresh weight, the total fresh weight of the sample, and then the percent total N and, and dry matter from the lab. And, um, and then we just use that Vigil Kissel equation to come up with total nitrogen per acre and uh, pounds of plant available nitrogen per acre. Um, during decomposition. Um, the other part of the calculator is, is figuring out the best application rates for supplemental fertilizers. So here, um, you, if, you, if growers add in their fertilizer prices uh, on a price per pound uh, basis, then they can scroll to the right of the spreadsheet and look at you know, plant available nitrogen. This is full season plant available nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and you know all the other major and minor or micronutrients, and figure out what's the cheapest f organic fertilizer uh, source for those nutrients. And then the last part of the um, oh, and then if they uh, if they have if they've entered the uh, management costs for their cover crop, like the cost of the seed, their fuel costs, their labor costs, their tractor size, their driving speeds, that kind of thing. We've got a I didn't go not showing it, but there's an economic spreadsheet. And it gives them a rough estimate of how much it costs them to grow the cover crop. So this calculates the cost of the plant available nitrogen from the cover crop. So one thing you can see right away is that in these two scenarios, uh, cover crop nitrogen was $130 to, $2, to $3 per pound of plant available nitrogen. And compared to the or other organic fertilizers, which $5.64 for feather meal at that price, 
it's pretty competitive, so it's sort of a no-brainer for the organic farmers to use legumes as a nitrogen source. But it's not necessarily true for conventional farmers using, using urea. Um, the, uh, so then the last part of it is the nutrients provided sheet, where we just, you, you select your cover crop field, so it credits your nitrogen, cover crop nitrogen credit. And then you just play around with different application rates of other organic fertilizers to balance your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and whatever else you're looking for. Um, our work was all done within the um, Willamette Valley, which is, uh, you know, we've got a very dry summer. We're operating in irrigated fields. Um, Amber Moore at the University of Idaho has um, validated a, a model for um, semi-arid conditions in irrigated fields there. And then Ted Radovich and Archana Pant are working on, they've got some funding to develop a, a similar models for, um, for the tropics in Hawaii. Um, David Brown is one of the farmers that we worked with a lot when we were developing this. And he's a real numbers guy, and, but he's got a pretty complex farming system, and, he, and he's very opportunistic about the way he will you know, use uh, horse manure or chicken manure and where it is in different parts of his field. Um, so uh, some, in some ways, the nitrogen management, when we first started working with him, was, a li it was difficult to understand. It was really complicated. Um, when we measured soil nitrates in his field, he had excessive levels of soil nitrates. So he was getting good, crop, good, good yield, good crop performance, but uh, was actually applying a lot more fertilizer than he needed to, and he wasn't really crediting the cover crop nitrogen. So we were pretty easily able to save him a lot of money on fertilizers and maintain his yields. We did have a little bit, like I think the year after I got that quote from him, we had a little bit of a train wreck in uh, early spring lettuce after, you know, well, and he just didn't kind of, uh, he didn't uh, supply enough nitrogen for that early, early season lettuce, so he had a bit of a deficiency. But he's still working with the program and, um, and using the calculator sometimes to, to, uh, to compare, evaluate his cover cropping program. Brian and Jason Monacuco are much larger scale growers and they put us in a field where they had um, farmed it heavily for, in, really intensively for, uh, four generations, and they weren't getting the kind of yields that they were used to, that their dad used to get from those fields. And we put cover crops in the field, and they got, um, they got, uh, they were, they actually spent almost as much time out there looking at the, at the table beets as we did, because this was, m most of the rest of their field looked like this, but where we had cover crops, they had a much more resilient system. It's very sandy soil, so they were losing, I think, probably losing a lot of their nitrogen, whereas when they had a cover, cover crop legume as a slow-release nitrogen source, I think it just improved the production a, a bit um, pretty easily. So these, the green, um, uh, the green symbols have feather meal fertilizer at about 100 pounds of plants available M per acre, and the gray symbols have uh, no fertilizer. So you can see the, the gray triangle and the, and the gray square are the rye vetch and vetch cover crops. And soil nitrates were somewhere around 25 parts per million during the season. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, the table beet yield was uh, you know, what they were, pretty acceptable yield. And soil nitrate levels were a little bit on the low end, about 15 parts per million nitrate. Um, but they were still getting pretty good yields. Um, and where they had the legume cover crop and the fertilizer, um, their yields increased just a little bit. Um, they actually, you know, have started to uh, cover crop a lot of their acreage um, since, since working with them. Scott Latham is um, on Savi Island. He's one of the, great, he's one of the uh, cover crop champions. And he's way better at establishing cover crops in all kinds of scenarios than I, than I am. Um, he's doing lots of relay seeding as well even in leaks and things like that. Um, they've got a 400 member CSA, 25 restaurants, about 20 acres they've increased, expanded a little bit since then. And they, didn't, they weren't crediting their cover crop nitrogen uh, quite enough when we started working with them. Um, and they were treating a lot of their crops the same, fertilizing a lot of them the same. Um, now they're not applying any nitrogen to their head lettuce because they're getting, you can see the kind of cover crop biomass he's getting on a consistent basis. And, um, and so he saves about $275 an acre on fertilizer, uh, but then he applies that. Uh, he, he buys additional nitrogen fertilizer for his broccoli crop where he wasn't getting enough um, 
wasn't getting enough nitrogen. So it's, he was using the tool, been using the tool to really do site-specific management. And that's one of the things Dan has been sort of impressing upon me is that a lot of what we're trying to do these days is make these general, general uh, guides that we publish more site-specific. And um, so the calculator has been a little bit frightening, actually. It's been downloaded a lot. Um, every state, there's somebody that's downloaded it. 47 different countries, and some of them couldn't be more diff different than Western Oregon. Um, the um, people that have been downloading it, maybe 35%, 36% of them have been farmers, and I didn't, 39% are other agricultural professionals, which I didn't, you know, when we first put it out there, I thought this is a tool for farmers, but it's just as important the, the other ag professionals that are, that are using it, students as well, and also some gardeners. So we're, I'm actually putting together a thousand square foot version instead of a per acre version. Um, that'll make it, it kind of makes the English system a little bit metric too, which I really like. So, um, yeah, that, uh, that's just up there to be provocative. I don't know how to measure impacts very well, but if a small percentage of the people using the calculator are saving a little bit of money per acre, we're estimating um, a pretty good economic, um, impact. Um, so there's lots of ideas for future work, um, and uh, just wanted to put those up. I'm not going to go through that, but just food for thought uh, while I field a couple of questions.